good morning, everybody. Um, thanks for coming. Uh, joining me on stage for this session is a creative partnership responsible for simply some of the best telly in the last 10 years. Black Mirror, of course, is a dark, twisted, dystopian anthology with themes ranging from the familiar, such as online abuse and the all-pervasiveness of technology, to the, quite frankly, ludicrous, such as the Prime Minister of Great Britain putting his cock inside a pig. <laughs> Will you please welcome Charlie Brooker and Annabelle Jones. <laughs> welcome both. How are you? Yeah, you know, yeah. Right. reasonable. Not reasonable bad. is good. Um, I'd like to know how you two first met. <laughs> Is this a therapy session? Yes. Um, I've got some tissues, I'll just move them. Uh, what was it, 2000 uh, and... One. One? Yeah. 15, 15 years ago. Um, 17. Good. Yeah. You've got a math, good. So, no, Someone's across say. the details. Yeah, 15, 16 years 16. ago. 16. 16 years, 16 years, ago. years ago. Yeah. <laughs> um, how did we, we met at um, Endemol? We met, yes, at Endemol. Um, and you, like, like you don't know, you had just set up a, a company with a few other comedy writers. You say that like I've no, got you any kind of up. business skills whatsoever. Yes, okay. You had just, someone you knew had <laughs> amassed you into a little group and set up a company. And I was at Endemol with Tim Hanks and Peter Bazalgette looking after a talent. And he managed to be... One of those people, and we didn't hate each other instantly. So it that was, took time. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. So 15 years we've working together. I mean, it's a unique partnership because oftentimes production and creative elements will be separate, but you two work very closely and extremely symbiotically, don't you? Yes, I suppose. I mean, how would you say we function as um, a unit? We're both uh, we, pedantic. We are, yes, I suppose that is... Are you pedantic? <laughs> I would expect that of you, Charlie, but I'm surprised. Uh, the, um, I mean, it's within, particularly with Black Mirror, I think, with an anthology, and when you're setting up very, your different alternative universes within each story, within each episode, you have to, there has to be a degree of pedantry, there has to be a, a level of detail to make the world feel authentic. And I think we're both very forensic and we just love the minutiae of the worlds and the logic and the characters and the stories. So we both challenge each other to, in terms of level of detail and... Uh, it's a nightmare, isn't it? It's we're a both nightmare. basically it's a bit a OCD nightmare. and we're yeah. constantly... Because each, each story often has its own sort of weird logical rule set mm. underpinning everything and so we're, we're sticklers for sort of noticing all of that kind of dull, boring, so life-crushing detail. So how will you show Annabelle the script? Will, you, will, you, or will it be from the, the, the original idea, the original inception? Will that be when you start sharing? Yes. I mean, we, we start discussing the story ideas generally. When we, so when we're planning a season, we'll start... Sometimes we'll sort of take a broad overview and we'll think, well, we're going to do six, six episodes. What genres haven't we done yet? Because we kind of think of the show as almost different genre pieces. Yeah. So last season, for instance, um, early on, for instance, I was saying I wanted to do a, a, an episode set in the past. And it was like, well, so how are we going to crack that nut? What, yeah. what could we do about that? And we also knew that we were going to do a sort of police procedural, a detective story. So we sort of broadly knew that. And then we'd discuss... Well, we, we discuss sort of general ideas and themes, and then quite often at some point I'll suddenly think, here's an unpleasant idea. Um, <laughs> quite quickly. Quite, quite quickly, quickly you'll get to that point, yeah. Usually it's an idea that makes me laugh and appalls you. Um, that's a general That's a gender that's stereotype. <laughs> I won't have that. Uh, yeah, but it's, it's a, there's a lot of chat. There's a lot of... You know, chat about either things that are unsettling or worrying or preposterous or funny, mm. and it just becomes a lot of it is just chat and observations, and and then Charlie normally finds a hook, and then suddenly it's what's the best way to tell that story. It's if I get enthused about the sort of unpleasantness of a situation, that's when I know I'm itching to sort of write the story, and there, and, and because they're always sort of what if. Um, scenarios and so so you know the, the whole series started by thinking well what if what if there was a 
situation. What if you had an episode of 24? That was sort of where it came from. If you had mm. an episode of 24 in which Jack Bauer was blackmailed into fucking a pig, how would that play out if you played it straight? That was the original sort of starting point. Um, and so it sort of stems from, it stems from thoughts like that. And I get kind of, I guess, impishly excited about that yeah. side of things. Because some, for me, as a fan of it, some, some of your thoughts are more obviously wrought than others. So if I think about Nosedive, which is the season opener for se uh, season three, mm -hmm. you can almost see the beginnings of that thought process, which is uh, everywhere we go, we are now rating and ranking things that we buy. What if that then became applicable to humans and our social interaction? Mm -hmm. And then some of your thought processes are much more layered and hidden, and you sort of don't get the big reveal until the very end. Yeah. Yes. Well, quite often, I suppose, sometimes we... Um, so, sometimes we're fortunate in that there'll be a sort of happy accident in that I'll be thinking of a, we'll be pursuing one story idea mm. and suddenly in the process of doing that a sort of a different and better idea occurs which, so we did an episode called White Bear which has got a huge twist in it and originally that didn't have the twist in it at all, it was a story about so it was kind of like a zombie apocalypse story mm. and within the episode there's a cover story that people tell to the main character in that and that was what the story was and I'd written the script and everything and we were looking around for locations where we could shoot it and suddenly I, I realised that where we were looking was on an old RAF base and it had a, a fence around the whole thing and I thought well actually what if this what if this, this story was taking place within a fenced environment? It was a theme park and none of it was really happening. It was a much better idea. So mm. in, a, in a way, that, 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 that was an idea that came about through stages, I suppose, if you sort yeah. of mean. So yeah. sometimes that's uh, San Junipero in, in season three, which oh, is the one yeah. set in the 1980s. That came about through thinking, I was, we were trying to do a story set in about somebody exploring the afterlife or trying to work out if there was an afterlife. And that collided with a story idea about um, old people and nostalgia therapy for people with Alzheimer's and suddenly, I can't remember, but suddenly the idea just popped up yeah. in the middle, I was just talking about it and it suddenly became a, well, oh well, hang on, what, what if it was a love story? Yeah. And it provides one of the only happy endings <laughs> in yes. the, I couldn't believe I was watching a happy ending when I watched that. I was Sorry. Really, <laughs> Sorry no, about that. I'm very disappointed um, of you. I was really worried <laughs> writing that. It was the that was the first one I'd written for Netflix, for the Netflix season. And it was a, so there was a conscious decision to sort of reinvent what the show was. Mm. But I was quite nervous because it's not what you would expect from a... What you expect from a Black Mirror is somebody staring at a transparent phone <laughs> in the future going, Ugh, basically. Um, <laughs> and it was sort of happy and nice and it had romance and hope. Yeah, it was be it's be I mean, if, if you haven't seen this, it's so beautiful. It's really powerful. But I sort of felt I was going to be led along this sort of beautiful path of romance and then you were going to crush us at the end. But no, it's, it's really, it's wonderful. I should point out at this uh, moment that you can, of course, ask questions at any point during the session. You can do that via an app because we're so very on the nose with technology. Um, so you can simply do that. We've had one in, they're all anonymous, of course. Um, where do you find your inspiration? And do you ever worry that the content will go too far or cause offence? I think we've we, gone quite far already. We opened with the Prime Minister fucking a pig, so. Yeah. We don't, I mean, yeah. like, that's a bit like the opening to Saving Private Ryan in that respect, isn't it? It sort of sorts the, <laughs> yeah. it's a baptism of fire. Um, what we don't do, and this is sometimes when people try and pitch us ideas for the series, they make, they, they I think, we don't tend to sort of look at the news or mm. look at the tech pages and go, oh, Samsung have brought out a new, a new yeah. chip that goes in your bum and, and <laughs> sings at your shits as you do them. Um, we don't tend to think, what's the story idea in that? Although that is a good... Yeah, it's a fantastic just, idea. Um, Hello? Sings them lovingly, cradles them out. Um, uh, we don't do that. It tends to be... It, tends to, it, it usually tends to stem from a, a sort of a, 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 a comic what-if idea. Yeah. That's, that's where the inspiration comes from. And I don't think we worry about going too far, ever. No. 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 I mean, we're... Did you, did you grow up watching this at the Twilight Zone and... Tales of the Unexpected, Tales, and yeah. yeah. Tales Twilight Zone, Tales of the Unexpected, Unexpected Hammer House of Horror, oh, yeah. and also just there were a lot of, this is something I remember from my childhood, is that it seemed every week there was a controversy over a, a, a controversial BBC play 
Um, and and yeah. sometimes there would be, or there would be things like the singing detective, or there yeah. would be bizarre sort of one-off, um, mm. you know, or something like Threads, which was you know like chilling and horrifying and not in any way comforting. Mm. Um, and at the time when we were first, um, when we were pitching the show initially, it's I felt like that sort of stuff was missing from television. Yeah. It felt like it was. I think the interesting thing about Tales of the Unexpected in terms of anthologies was that a lot of the stories were, were in very domestic, safe settings. Mm. And it, but they were just terrifying. Yes. I think as a child, when you see that, you, it's really uncomfortable. And I think that's the appealing thing about Black Mirror, taking very normal, often very small personal stories and just twisting them into a very dark place. Because there's just something that sort of resonates more with that than yeah. a sort of big supernatural Twilight Zone type. Yes, it's a reality stuff. slightly refracted, isn't it? So it's yeah. still very, you know, it's so possible. Yeah. Um, I wonder if it's, if it's something to do with being children of the 70s. Well, we were just bombarded with those sort of Charlie Says type cautionary tales. If you go outside, you'll be electrocuted, you'll get rabies, you'll drown, Donald Pleasance will be, you know, dressed as the Grim Reaper and provide the narration. Do you think there's something in that about... Oh, I love all that stuff, yeah. because that's... I'm a terrible neurotic and a, a massive worrier, and I constantly think that I'm facing death. Um, and so... Which you are. Which I am. And those... That, that, yeah. that's, that, the, 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 I, I, there's something I like about the of the heartlessness of those old like public information mm. films or the, the, mm. the unsettling nature of that, mm. um, that world that we, I, I guess we sometimes try to evoke. Um, and Dennis Potter, like you were saying, you know, mm. if you're growing up with a Dennis Potter play, which is just baffling, you know, often baffling. To a child, you're totally confused. And mm -hmm. that's quite frightening. You sort of go, I don't quite understand what's going on in this world. You don't often get dramas that are allowed to confuse you know, or to, to, to challenge you in such a way. And in, and in some cases, your, y y your shows will run for maybe 40, 50 minutes before you're really clear which world you are in. Mm. And that shows a, a rem <laughs> remarkable, quite brilliant confidence in not only the material, but the ability of your fans to stay with. Or poor structuring. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I suppose sometimes it's a useful... Um, it is a useful... Uh, trick, weirdly, when right. So, San Junipero, for instance, mm. in that there is a big twist that becomes apparent about sort of two thirds of the way yeah. through. And so, for two thirds of it, I'm withholding information in the, yes. in the script. And that's actually quite a useful restriction to have when you're yeah. writing it because it actually defines a lot of the choices you're making. So, you're not just staring at a blank page, you know, there's only this much wriggle room for what yeah. you can say that they're doing and every li every line that they say has to make sense uh, like on the broader reality of that they are two old women basically yeah. in, in in secret mm. so sometimes it's useful it's just a useful um uh useful to, it's a useful kick up the arse or it's, it's a useful restriction to have but in that one, your, your starting point wasn't uh, necessarily a love story. It was about going back in time and wanting to do a sort of almost back to the, back to the future style kind of repeat fade in a, in a sort of 80s bar. Yeah, yeah it was because I was trying to think, well, there was several, I, I was trying to think, like, how could we do it? Because, because, because it was an, an attempt to upend what the show was, I was thinking, well, we're, we're always set in the future. How can we do one set in the past? How can we do one that's hopeful rather than bleak? Um, and because I'd read somewhere somebody moaning that because we'd gone to Netflix, it was, was the show going to become completely Americanized? So I thought, well, fuck you then. <laughs> Set in California. I eat that. Um, so it sort of, it, it kind of broke all those rules we'd established um, generally. Has, yes. I mean, teeing that question up, has the, has the show changed since you've, I mean, obviously it began life on Channel 4. Did mm -hmm. you have to make any shift at all to accommodate a new partnership? Not no. really, no. I, I think it, uh, it allows you to tell different stories. Mm. I, I would say being, I suppose if you're making a show for a now a global audience, you are more justified or you can, you can tell more stories in America or wherever you can choose the world for that story a little bit more mm -hmm. that might have felt odd on Channel 4. So San Junipero, the episode we were talking about, you know, it felt more natural for it to be in America, in California, because a lot of our 80s references are American. Yeah. So it's liberating in that sense. Yeah, we had a discussion about should it be set in like Brighton or, or mm. in the 80s, and it was a bit like, well, then it would be, so it would be a, 
you associate it with like people like crying about the miners' strike. That sounds really dismissive. <laughs> it's not, it's like, but, you know, it's not, it's like, um, like 80s Britain doesn't feel like quite such a utopia in the yeah. way that like like the the, the, the teen sort of movies of the 80s feel yeah. Yeah. feel iconic and you expect Judd Nelson to sort of walk in at any, at any frame. Exactly. You know, sort of. um, um, yes. Let's take a, a moment actually for those who aren't. Uh, up to speed with uh, season three. Uh, we've got a sort of montage for you to enjoy. Here it is. In this world, we're all so caught up in our own heads, it's easy to lose sight of what's real. You said you don't know how much time there is. What does that mean? It's important that you realize there is a small medical procedure involved. Sorry for a game. I didn't expect to find myself living in the future, but here I fucking well am. So you recently logged your first kill. Huh? And how did that feel? They filmed me. Through my computer camera. You ready? If we drill down into the numbers, you have got a solid popularity arc here. No one is this happy. A two year old with a fucking balloon isn't this happy. Singularity is when computers learn to outsmart man like women did. Years ago. You are so adorable. We're genuinely empathetic as a species. We don't actually really want to kill each other. Gotcha. This means fun. Or it should. Actually, it's, it's quite hard to, to promote uh, an anthology show, especially mm. one where, because we're always, there's, there's quite often stuff we don't want to tell you and we yes. don't want to show you. It's quite difficult to advertise the show sometimes. We can't really tell you, oh, it's, a, it's about a, a chemistry teacher who becomes a, a, a meth Create, you know, a, a meth kingpin. We, we can't tell you sort of no. what's going on in the show, so we have to sort of... You know that's uh, already been done. Yes, that has that been that yeah. has bloody been done, hasn't okay. it? Yeah. That's but not I episode that. fucked. <laughs> but what draws you in is you're right. You can't you can't give too much away. What draws you in is an, 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 the extraordinary direction, sort of the, the, the way that it looks, and the cast that you bring to it. And that's a, a, something you're you, the casting is something you're both integrally involved in. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, I, I, and the, each one is is run as a separate film, basically. Yeah. So it's a it's. It's, I guess, a pretty good gig for a director and, and for the cast because there, it's not a huge commitment time-wise. Yeah. And obviously for a, for a director coming in, they get to, you know, the, the, the rules haven't been established. So that they, they get to set the look and they get to work with their own, the DOP that they want to. And yeah. There's a lot of creative freedom, I think, with an anthology and particularly with Netflix as well. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, hopefully it's a... It's it's a it's a good gig for someone, and it's run like a you know they're all totally autonomous. They're all run as their own feature films, and um, with all of the time and preparation that that takes. So yeah, I think it's I think it, it allows the film to sort of realise itself fully. It means that, that I mean it, it is also a pain in the ass that <laughs> because it means you've got because the you have to reinvent the wheel every single time. So yes. you know even just. You know the, the the look of the grade isn't set for episode to episode. The set is different. The you know everything is different. The composer we have to find a new composer every time. So so all of those things you're, you're starting from scratch every single time, which is one of the things I think that made me realise why there are fewer anthology shows than there used to be. Somebody said somebody said to me I was I was saying to somebody once God there used to be tons in the you know with the Twilight Zone in the fifties and sixties and they said yeah but they used all the old sets didn't they from Hollywood films. Oh so that's I, what they did they just march in and yeah and I went oh. Oh, if I'd known that, I wouldn't have bothered. 
so for two people who describe themselves as having, you know, sort of OCD and, you know, that you, you have such a forensic level of control, when you're running an anthology, presumably at some point you have to say to the director, it's all yours now, because you can't micromanage everything. Because you're running production simultaneously. Have you got... No. Okay. So we don't, just exactly for that reason. So they all film separately and they are all their own separate blocks um, to allow us to be across everything. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and when you're, when you're working with Netflix or any of the American networks, you know, they, they are used to much longer runs of, you know, 10 or 13 episodes. And we decided not to, you know, we, we sort of said we'd rather limit it to six because we felt that we could cope and maintain that quality across six, whereas you couldn't do it for 13. Mm. Um, we never I think it's, you know, if you've yeah. got the privilege of doing an anthology where you get to reinvent every single episode, you want to enjoy it and you want to, you yeah. know, it's a privilege to do it. You want to do it well. Um, so we structure it so that we can be that annoying across everything. We are quite annoying across all aspects yeah. of it. I mean, we do get involved in every... I, I kind of, and I kind of like the sort of silly detail of getting involved in the typography of a sort of thing that's in the background for one second and the light, all of that kind of thing. They I, we, must love you, the art department. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh. I'm con I am constantly sort of going, I don't know, I think the lettering would be a bit closer to get like, like really <laughs> anal stuff like that I'd love. Yeah. But a lot of it is product design as well because we're, yeah. we're designing operating systems and products that have to feel seductive and mm. feel grounded and real. Yeah. Yeah. So you, quite often while you're doing it, you realise we're sort of on Dragon's Den in some way, like yeah. designing a sort of user product. Yeah. You're um, absolutely right. I mean, no, there's, there's the, the, each, each world that you create has to be fully fleshed out. Mm. You're right, the word seductive, and it is. And that's sort of the cautionary tale behind most of the episodes, is that technology draws you in and, and, and excites, but also corrupts. And yes. it takes away as much as it, as it gives you. It, what does it? You see, I don't know. I can't work out how anti. I'm because uh, when I go to America, because they don't know me at all. Generally, they, they, I think everyone assumes I'm like the Unabomber or something <laughs> like, like some sort of angry luddite who's like delivering this stark warning. Um, and and actually, you know, are you, this would be the worst show to do if you yeah, hated yeah, technology yeah. because so much of it is about immersing yourself in it and the look and the feel of it and working out what would work. I think yeah. I am just, a, I worry about the negative consequences of things, just naturally. I, I could worry about the negative consequences of a fucking wagon wheel. <laughs> so, you know, it doesn't, it, I'm, but I'm very pro wagon wheels. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah. You, have to, you have to love the technology, because I think all of the worlds, you want them to feel authentic. You want to feel, I could imagine myself, I would have accepted that technology into the world because it's easier, it makes my life easier, it makes yeah. it more fun. You have to love it, otherwise you, the story doesn't feel realistic. You know, you wouldn't, you don't believe that character would have been in that world. Yes. So you have to love everything. And we're led very slowly to these conclusions. You know, nothing happens, because, you know, nothing happens rapidly in Black Mirror. It's all just, mm. feels, yeah. it seeps in. It's often, it's the human dilemma. It's the small personal story that the, the drama is in rather than the big concept. We don't do big conspiracies. We don't do evil corporations. They're all very small, small stories, personal mm. stories, but in an alternative but not that alternative universe. Although I did realise one, at one point I'd written to a sort of formula. After, I suddenly realised at one point, and this was when I did San Junipero, I thought, every episode I've done so far, it starts with a character who's sort of in a trap, and then they stay in the trap. Yes, yes. <laughs> they realise the trap they're in, and then yes. scream forever. Yes. And so, so, so sometimes I think that's what I end up doing. It's like slowly, slowly, slowly pointing out why the situation is worse than they fear. Well, they're weirdly in San Junipero, which is yeah. why I loved it, is because I, I suppose they, they, they choose a trap that is beautiful and positive. It's a nice trap. It's a great trap. Yeah. Everyone would want that trap. Good. Yeah. And nosedive. Nosedive, the Bryce Dallas Howard. Yeah. She gets out of the trap. She, yeah, she rebels in her own way. Yeah. And I think we've got a few more upbeat stories Well, we're trying to, we do, season. we do try, it's interesting, because doing, doing San Junipero did, did prove to me that you can do an uplifting episode of Black Mirror. Yeah. So we are varying the tone a little yeah. more going forward. I was going to ask that, because we, we sort of worked out that in the first series, most were very, very dark and had horrific endings. Then it got to two thirds, and this series is mu there are much more sort of there are nuggets of brightness throughout. Yes, well, partly because we we, we did. I mean, early on when we, when we knew we were doing six, we thought if you do six downers, yeah. that's just too much for anyone. 
Um, and, so, and also, you, you just come to expect it. Yeah. So as you were saying, when you were watching um, San Junipero, you were, you were worried that it was going to it was going to turn nasty. Yeah, right? and then and it doesn't. So it's a, it's, it becomes a surprise. So so um, I think we're we're now able to adjust the tone more, which is not you necessarily can, to say yeah. like uplifting episodes. We can do kind of more comedic episodes or yeah. more. Yeah. I think you can you can afford the more upbeat positive film without destabilizing the whole season mm. when you're a run of six. Which is not so. Which you don't want to shortchange the people who want the sort of horrible yeah. white bear play test like shut yes. up and dance punch yeah. to the horrible body blows raining down on you. <laughs> so but you even within San Junipero, whilst it is you know more upbeat, there's some interesting, challenging questions asked about mortality, about you know how we live our lives and how. Yeah, all those things. And, so, and whether you want her a forever after, yeah, actually. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. whether oblivion isn't sometimes uh, given your life mm. a better option. Mm. So, yeah, that, that, that's all that complexity. That's a thing to say, aren't it? Yeah, yeah, I feel bad I said that. Time. Jesus. Ooh, that's left a real <laughs> weight in the room, hasn't it? <laughs> Let's get a question. Um, at which point, says Gerald, at which point do you start considering music in the creative process, which is, of course, such an essential part of your films? Uh, it really varies. Uh, well, we, yeah. Um, I think we have a sense of the tone. Quite. I mean, because I, it's often interesting the, the potential for tonal misinterpretation of some of the episodes. So when we're looking for directors, you know, obviously we meet quite a few people and we'll talk about the themes. And you gain so much from those meetings and chats about how people have interpreted the script or interpreted the idea. And we'll have sort of quite a strong idea about tonally where it should fit mm. because some of the ideas you could play you know really comically and some of them you could play darkly comedy some of them very satirical so it's about so i think we have a tonal sense quite early on mm -hmm. and then when you meet with the director it forms at that very early stage and then mm. when obviously when you're into the filming you'll often have the music that you're sort of being inspired by so it's sort of it seeds in quite early but in terms of choosing or working with the actual composer that's more at the edit mm. stage and difficult for a composer because in the same way that a lot of what you're writing is masking and sort of leading the viewer astray, mm -hmm. the music, of course, has to sort of, you can't have that da 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 da, -da <laughs> you know? it, it has to be equally be subtle and mm -hmm. lure you with a sense of positivity, whereas perhaps the ending won't be so. Well, Nosedive is a good example, actually, because mm -hmm. Nosedive is, 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 it presents a very saccharine mm -hmm. world and then Max Richter's score is melancholy. And that was that was very deliberate. That was Joe Wright deliberately was had that in, said actually from the start that he wanted it to have that tone, the music mm. to have that tone. So the temp score he put on was a different Max Richter yeah. track. Sometimes I mean, often when I'm writing the episodes, I I now go for a run if I can't think of it. It's, I, I don't recognise myself from a few years ago. What's I guess happened? I, I guess up and I go for a fucking jog like a prick, um, <laughs> and I'll listen to sort of music and uh, and. And after a while, you sort of see scenarios, or you suddenly think of some moment in a story that you can't, you haven't quite worked out, and something about there's a symbiosis of music and ideas, yeah. and probably the endorphins going through your system that get you temporarily enthused about this fucking miserable existence, um, <laughs> and so you can sort of go home and and write it. And some, sometimes, sometimes specifically, we'll sort of specify tracks and things like that in the in the script. Okay. Mm. Um, yeah. Because San Junipero is very different. It's almost like a jukebox, isn't yeah. it? So yeah. you've got a soundtrack yeah. that is uh, just absolutely mainlining you into nostalgic 1980s mm -hmm. yeah. sort of celebration. Whereas, yes. Whereas often when we're creating an alternative world, we don't use any commercial tracks at all. Yes. Just to help distance you and put you in that otherworldliness. Yes. So it's, so it's a joy to do something like San Junipero. Please. San Junipero, that, that, was, that, was, that was literally, that there was a moment where I, was, I went running and uh, I had a, I'd made a, play, a playlist of music from a, 1987 and Heaven is a Place on Earth mm. came on, on and suddenly I thought, oh, I know what the ending shot is. Um, and, and so that did a job for me and I was really worried we weren't going to be able to clear that. That would have been a nightmare. All the tracks in that are a joke as well. If you go back and listen to it, okay. every single piece of music we use in that is commenting is ironically <laughs> commenting on what the scenario is. So there's tracks like "Fake" by Alexander yes. O'Neill and "Living in a Box," uh, because that's sort of ultimately what they're doing. Yeah. Um, How indulgent are we? I know. I sound like a real <laughs> wanker. 
How many... Sorry, I've got a comment to you. <laughs> How, you. You say that you, obviously each one has its own filming block, but... When you two are collaborating, how are you? Are you writing more than one script concomitantly, or is it j you, you finish one and get that nailed down? Or well, um, we're constantly redrafting. So mm. often mm. we've got all six films live in our heads and live and in production or pre-production or post. Are you a tough yeah. critic? Are you harsh on him? Yeah. Yeah, you fucking are. <laughs> well, no, I think because we've no, really known each way. other for a long time. Yeah. I don't, we don't take ourselves too, we don't take each other seriously. Maybe that's, the, maybe that's the key to success. No, we are, yeah, I think we've got... I think so. It's a funny <laughs> thing as the, the, in the, as, as the writer that it's horrible getting notes. Like, mm. it's sort of horrible, but also necessary. So it's a bit like a hard massage that hurts, and you ache for days, but you know ultimately mm. you're going to feel a bit better. It's kind of like that, I suppose, and, and your natural instinct is to get all defensive and, and sort of go... Yeah. But sometimes you're very encouraging as well. Like, Hated in the Nation we did, which was a 90 minute and I mm. kept trying to abandon the script and going, well, this is just silly. This is just daft. This story is just fucking ridiculous. And you kept saying, go on, keep going, probably because you were worried about deadlines. Yeah. So keep going. It's, and, and so I got to the end and, and, and it helped see me through. But always, when, um, generally speaking, when you get a note, even if it's one that you massively disagree with, it's, it's, it's an indication that something is not... Yeah. There's, a, there's a faulty bit of the machine somewhere. And that's the ones that I tend to get the most defensive about, is when I know that you're right. <laughs> because there's a big rewrite that's going to have to follow. Yeah, which is horrible. Mm. But, also, but then when you get it out, it's like it's, yeah. there's a pleasant physical purging <laughs> sensation. But also, because we, have to, because we have to go and build these worlds, and we have to take actors with us, and we have to you know, find directors, you've got to absolutely be able to defend that world, and, or, or explain the world, and explain what you're trying to achieve with that mm. world. So we, that's maybe why we forensically examine everything, mm. and make sure that that world feels authentic and realistic, to, to make us feel uh, allowed to mm. sort of approach other people and say, this is the story we want to tell. It's a weird thing that sometimes, sometimes the scripts, like sometimes we, there's a lot of back and forth, yeah. And other times I'll go off and, it, and I, sometimes I can write things really, really insanely quickly. Like how quickly for a script? Uh, what's the record? Three, two, two three two days? days? What? Oh, it's not. He's um, what, for like a six, 60, 70 minute? Not a 70 minute, but like, a, like um, San Junipero was really quick. It was uh, like under a week, I think, San Junipero. Like it was like four days, something like that. But I can't remember what my record is. I think it is two days, it is three two days. days. Um, where Nuts. if you get really... I feel inferior now. Does anyone else feel inferior? <laughs> but, but, but there's a lot of self-hatred that goes in before that. And sometimes, I've, like, so White Bear, for instance, I'd yeah. written the script completely differently twice. It had a very different story. And then I, because I suddenly got enthused about this new version of it, I went off and wrote that. I think that might have been the two dayer. Um, like, and it was a really good episode because I was so excited, I just sort of, it was kind of like automatic writing like that. San Junipero was one where we'd worked out the outline, basically, mm. for the story, um, but it ended, it actually, the story actually originally ended, uh, without wanting to spoil it too much, at the point where um, Kelly, Elder Kelly goes into a hospital and sees Yorkie in real life for the first yes. time. That was where the story ended in the original outline. And when I was writing it, I just kept going, and actually all this extra stuff came out. Whenever people, writers sort of say, oh, you know, I kept the, the characters told me what they wanted to do, and I, I always thought, you fucking liar. And then it was sort of true, so to retrospectively go back and apologise. I presume some, as you say, some are, some are harder. So, so you have those, the automatic writing episodes where mm. it flows. Yeah. Um, is, is, are there any episodes that spring to mind which were just painful, painfully um, wrought? Uh, yes, there's been ones that, certainly ones that are more, it tends to be oddly, so Hated in the Nation was one because it was a police procedural, yeah. and so there's a lot of sort of Rubik's Cube style, oh, you've got yeah. to drop this clue in here, and then they've got to go and speak yeah. to this person. And then, so the, when there's a lot of logical parts moving around like that, it's quite difficult. But if it's a big sort of emotional... Well, if, I've got to, if I've got to write a scene where a character has a big emotional speech, like, so in there's a, episode 15 Million Merits where Daniel Kaluuya comes up and gives this big sort of speech, and in San Junipero there's a bit where Kelly does a big yeah. speech. I try not to think about it, and I try to write it in one go without going back to look at it, because then I think, I believe it will come out more authentically. Yes. So it will come out like a big... Splurge. Which is not too considered because emotional yeah. moments aren't considered, are they? They're just. Yes. 
So that is, is, is that lazy? I don't know. Is no, it lazy? Is it, it a good come, trick? I don't know. It doesn't come across as lazy. Um, but sometimes they can be a real uphill struggle. You can never really predict which ones are going to come out. Like, it's like going to the toilet. <laughs> I'll bear that in mind mm. next time I'm at the toilet. <laughs> think about that. I think think about of it. me. Um, I'm, I will only now think of you when I go to the toilet. Every time. Uh, Ollie is saying, have you considered breaking, <gasps> sacrosanct, breaking the anthology structure and sequeling one of your existing episodes? Yes. Um, yeah, well, sometimes we've had ideas for, there's like, there's a White Bear episode that was a sort of sequel idea that came to mind very quickly. Um, I think... There are, you could certainly do, most of our stories have definitive endings, mm. so we wouldn't want to necessarily go back and deal with the same characters, but there's certainly scenarios or worlds that you could go back. And we, we've, having said, we always used to be asked, are the episodes linked? And yeah. I always said, no, they're all completely separate. And then we started dropping Easter eggs and little references in, and we've done more of that. And in this season coming up, We've got even, I've explicitly linked about four different episodes at one point. Um, so it's there's lazy. No, sorry? It's lazy. Lazy. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's some, sometimes it's a clearance thing. So you go, <laughs> oh, we've got a clear and made up um, news network. Well, we used UK and National Anthem. We'll use that again. Oh, we might as well have got to come up with something on the news ticket. Oh, we'll, 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 we'll have a news story about the Prime Minister from the first one being thrown out of a zoo <laughs> for inappropriate behaviour. That's a funny <laughs> little joke. And then suddenly you've built a nested world that, where everything's linked. Sure. Um, but we've, we've thought about... I think there's a way of doing... You could, if you were going to do, say, a, a, a follow-up to something like San Junipero or Nosedive, I think you'd slightly do it in a slightly different medium, like almost as a graphic novel or as an animation or something like that, yeah. because I wouldn't yeah. want to... Unless we had an yeah. idea that absolutely relied on it being live-action, I think. Yes. Mm. Mm. And you have enough ideas to keep the anthology going, and so, what, you know, why Hopefully. not? Um, so, looking at the way you, you, you start writing, you, you maybe start with a sense of location uh, or time frame with a human, uh, a human emotion such as sort of grief or exclusion, whatever it might be. Um, and then you have maybe an idea of the technology that you want to explore, mm -hmm. both the pros and, and cons of. Increasingly, as this show gets more and more global and more and more successful, do you start, do you write things with actors in mind? Because you must now get people saying, I want to do that. I mean, you had John Hamm, obviously, mm -hmm. who, who came to you for the, the Christmas special. Is, is that happening more and more? You're getting big stars and, and you think, oh, no, I'll do something, I'll do something bespoke for... It's weird, we, like, we have, we've had people approach us and stuff and then weirdly, sometimes it's been like, oh, some, like, there's been a good opportunity where someone's approached us and then I'm like, I don't have a, I haven't got a story yet that yeah. fits that, that person, like, yeah. it's like they're not right for that story. So that's yeah. happened. Um, and I, that's, and I, that's the curse about doing an anthology, you know, mm. doing an anthology like this. You can't, and Charlie writing all of them, you can't, uh, you can't plan like a feature. You can't plan for a year ahead and ask an yes. actor to hold, you know, so many weeks mm -hmm. for you and years. Because normally we're like, oh my God, we've got another one today. There's quite often quite There's a, not a enough scramble. Lead time. And then I'll be worrying about the next three episodes at the same yeah. time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but wait, wait, I mean, just yeah. as a, in, in terms of writing it, obviously, because when, when I'm writing it, what I, tr I try and do, I suppose, is just picture, picture, what, picture the finished film and then describe it. So that's the other thing I'm doing. So picturing yeah. the finished film and describe it. And as part of doing that, you cast it in your head. So sometimes I will sort of pull people off the peg and, and imagine them in the role um, and then just write that. And what's quite... What's interesting I've found is that I can never remember who those people are by the time we get to this. So with, with San Junipero or Nosedive, I, I wouldn't have picture, I didn't picture any of those specific actresses while writing it, but now I can't. They've overwritten the version I had in my head. Yes. Mm. I mean, the, the casting is, is superlative on those. It'd be really extraordinary because... Uh, now I can't remember. That. It's, it, um, Shut Up and Dance. Alex yes, Lorber. with Alex Lawther and Jerome Flynn, yes. The very model of, in, I mean, he, he the, I don't want to spoil it, but you have mm. somebody who's the very model of innocence. If you were to shut your eyes and think of, of, of the sweetest, most beautiful young man, you couldn't find a better example. I mean, the casting is impeccable. You then, of course, go on to shatter everything <laughs> because you're a pack of bastards. <laughs> Thank you. We've got uh, so Gina yeah. Jay who does our casting. Yeah. Was, that, I think she championed Alex from an early stage. Yeah, for that as did James, the director. And, and yeah. you both there, and you watch all the cast. You physically there? You just watch tapes or? 
We, yeah, we yeah. watch everything, yeah. I mean, it's, it's that distinction between exec producers and showrunners. Mm. As showrunners, you're just across every single stage. And I think it's very important, particularly with an anthology where every story being different, that the showrunners who understand every single scene, every single line, every character mm. are across the whole production. I think that's maybe where Black Mirror sort of has its strength. Mm. That sort of because every because tonally they're all very different. You need that unifying sensibility across the season to give to make it feel as if you're getting a Black Mirror story. Yeah, we've so, been really. Yeah. I mean, we've been really, really fortunate with casting. We've had like mm. brilliant, which I mean, is brilliant from my perspective because it makes me look much cleverer <laughs> if they're so fucking good at at, at, yeah. at, at delivering my nonsense dialogue. But um, just new and different actor. names and different, fa you know, different faces and just much more diverse cast than you'll find. I mean, that's obviously part mm. and parcel of being an anthology as well. Well, you mentioned it's, that's an interesting one in that sometimes, again, like, I think as the show has gone on, the, the range of characters has become, has become more varied anyway. Mm. Sandy Napero, I mean, we keep returning to that one, but originally when we, I came up with the story, it was a heterosexual couple. That I, I was picturing and then I suddenly thought well what if it isn't if it's a same-sex couple then suddenly there's an extra layer on top of everything because we're dealing with a couple who couldn't have got married in 1987 and that's sort of part of the story mm. and it becomes it sort of and 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 the it, it made sense thematically that the theme of that episode was people sort of making living their lives again or, or making different choices yeah. but I, I was very nervous about writing it because I sort of thought am I just is, am I going to get this completely wrong Am I gonna, is this gonna? Is this gonna? Is this gonna be embarrassing? No, because you wrote a love story, and that's of course applicable to to everybody, whether they're in same-sex relationships or, or not. Yes, but I don't feel any human emotions. But so I'm afraid. I have, I'm like trying to. So it's, diff, it's a difficult thing. I hate to, to break convey. the suit, but you, you have you have. You, you have created something which will evince, if that's the right word, you, we, we feel, you know, so it's really, it's really good. I mean, they're all really good, but I love that. Um, anonymous is. is do you find uh, satire a particularly challenging genre to write in the current climate? I mean, we've talked about, obviously, uh, pig fucking uh, becoming a, not a reality, but, a, mm -hmm. you know, uh, uh, certainly was big in the press. Um, and I suppose Waldo as well, and the idea of puppeteering yep. and Trump. Do you find that reality is catching up with you as quickly as you try and outrun it? So it's a bit like, well, sometimes if you were writing, it's a bit like trying to write a a satirical piece where the Prime Minister's fucking the pig in the middle of a pig fucking orgy at the moment, <laughs> isn't it? Um, so, <laughs> just, sorry. Um, it is, it is tr tricky to sit, mm. because everything's moving so fast, everything yeah, seems yeah. to be changing very quickly at the moment. Um, I, I often tend to feel that, I, I think, I, I, certainly like, so with the season coming up, I've tried not to think too much specifically about what's going on because I think it comes out anyway in what you're writing. Yeah. And by the time, if I'd written a very, very topical episode, by the time it, it appears, okay. God knows where we'll be. So um, it, is, it is difficult. But then on the other hand, I think satire generally is sort of... Is one, one function it does provide, and I remember this from growing up in the 70s and 80s, if I'd watched Spitting Image and they were worried about nuclear war, mm, yeah. I felt like I wasn't insane. Do you know what I mean? It felt yes, like, oh, yeah, thank yeah. fuck for that. There's some other sane people around in the world. So it's just on that level, I think it, it provides a decent... So you find alarmism service. comforting? <laughs> Weirdly, when... Yeah, uh, I do. <laughs> genuinely, whenever... Because I, I always worry about everything. So when everyone's worried about the state of the world, I can kind of take the day off. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of genuinely get a bit more relaxed when everyone's terrified about the state of the world. But you two are providing that function. Because you, you, <laughs> the anthology is, is, cre is creating a sense of... Sort of slight, yes, a slight unease about the future and what, what we're creating collectively as a society, which I find calming. <laughs> it must be therapeutic for us to work on. Is it therapeutic to watch then? It is, it is in many ways, because it's sort of... I think seeing, seeing the, the broad array... Of, I, mean, I don't know if everyone feels the same, but seeing the full array of darkness that we're potentially capable of is, and realising that you don't have an active role to play in that darkness is really nice. It's like, <laughs> I feel like an okay person. You know, I haven't put someone in a thought experiment for eternity, screaming into the abyss. So yeah, I'm gonna go make a cup of tea. 
Oh, good. I, I hope that within all of that darkness, there are moments of light belief. There are moments yeah. of humour, I hope. Aren't of course there, there are, so, no, of course. You know, I hope they're up there. I hope the stories are entertaining, even well, it's, if it's depressing. It's, no, because yeah. in, in, in the same way that, uh, you know, Tales of Expected, there's a relish. Mm. There's a real positive relish to the, to the ghoulishness. And, and, you know, <laughs> and there's a... They're cautionary tales, some of them. I mean, wrongdoers are punished a lot in the world that you've, you've created. Massive sort of punishment gets meted out yeah. in the Black Mirror universe. Yeah. Like, a massive, yeah. great stone weight of punishment crushes people. Because yeah. uh, I, 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 I remember that feeling of... I remember, as a kid, like, stumbling across the Wicker Man late yeah, at night yeah. on TV, knowing nothing about it. Mm. And, and, and at the end, being... Devastated <laughs> that 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 had been allowed to happen on my television. Um, d d marveling at that, so I, I kind of like those really like unfair universe stories. I think as weirdly uh, comforting to a certain breed of person. I always <laughs> watch that and think, but the poor animals. I was sort of all right. I was sort of right. But it's just, oh, don't burn the chickens or whatever in there. Don't. <laughs> yeah, that's not on, is that's, it? Yeah. Edward Woodward, fuck him. Yes. But, yeah, this, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> um, so, uh, Sarah has said, um, you mentioned that people often pitch you story ideas. Have you taken any on? Have you ever, I mean, you two work so perfectly together. Would you consider widening out the... We do, I mean, we do, we've, we've done, well, I'm like in this season coming up, so um, in an, like, uh, Penn Gillette from Penn and Teller was mm. in London and he dropped me a, like a message going, oh, I'm a big Black Mirror fan, do you want to meet up for a coffee? And I met him and he sort of like told me an idea for a, for a story which we've incorporated into the season that's coming up. For yeah. instance, we've got we've got we've got a. I think I can say we've got one that's an anthology story yeah. again. Like we did, we did our Christmas special was yeah. three stories in one. We've done another one that's like a Treehouse of Horror <laughs> episode. And so one of the stories is based very directly on on an idea that that Pendulet came up with. Yeah. Um, um, and Jesse Armstrong. Jesse Armstrong doing yes. the, the yes. Times yes. review. Yeah. Um, yeah. Idea. And so we we do take them on. What and interestingly, both of those ideas. Um, a very simple concept mm. and quite popcorn in a way. Like it's mm. a popcorn idea to go, well, if you could rewind your memories, how would that affect the arguments you might have with your other half sort of thing? Mm. Um, and, and, and Penn's idea is very simple and grabby. And I think those are the ideas we tend to take on. Very, very, very simple yeah. and really quite mainstream popcorn ideas, campfire tales. I think it's yeah. when, when people come to us, they sometimes get a little too elaborate mm. or a little too earnest and say, I've come up with this. And when, when the show gets too earnest, that's when I start to think, well, slightly, there's, there's a sense of playful relish yeah. that I think should always be at its heart, even if it's very disguised under layers of unfairness. And yeah, because as you say, the, the technology has to be stuck. It is, but the whole world's very seductive. You want it. Yeah. You mm -hmm. want it, and you, you might get burnt by it, but that's sort of that's part of the price you, you, you pay. Uh, we talked a lot about um, Series 4. Well, we're lucky enough to have, uh, I think, a little preview. So let's take a look at that. I want to see a bit more of that. <laughs> There's, a, there's a, some glimpses of stuff that's coming up hmm. in the next season. Yeah. No one's seen that yet. No. no. Mm? As you say, it's hard for you to promote because you can't, you can't say any more. It's, yeah. it's deliberately <laughs> quite opaque, that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, you see, you see quite a few things there. Here are that's some new... images. Here are yeah. some disconnected images. Yeah. But you there's sort of the... new genres, the yes, new some... stories, new worlds. Quite, quite ambitious, this current season, I would say, in yes. terms of scale, in terms of... The effects, mm. you know, in terms of the sort of post elements, huge. Mm -hmm. so, and yeah, uh, th which leads on to actually to this question, which is from James. When you're working with Netflix, do they have a lot of creative control? And presumably, also, is there a budget implication for making that that move? Have you been able to be more expansive in the way that you approach the material? Yeah, I think you know, if you're making a show for the UK, there's there's a limit to the budget. You're making the show for a huge global audience for Netflix, then, then there's going to be more money. So yes, it does creatively free you up to take on bigger stories. Mm -hmm. um, but Netflix, I think, have a very good reputation for leaving their creatives to run their own shows. Mm. Um, so there's a lot of freedom. That's not to say they're hands-off, because they're not. They're very involved, they're very engaged, and give lots of notes. They're just not prescriptive. They're much, it's much more of a conversation. Mm. But having said that, we were very lucky in the UK with Channel 4, who maybe are, you know, similarly 
similar to Netflix in that respect. In yeah, I've, I like, certainly. I, I think I've always been really lucky to never have had really ghastly notes from sort of channels mm. ever on yeah. anything. But um, uh, no, they're, nev they're never prescriptive. It's interesting in that we do, um, you can, it, it, we, we've massively varied the lengths of our episodes again in the coming seasons. Yeah. So we've got like the shortest episode we've ever done is, is, is in the season coming up, for instance. So you can kind of, because you're, because you're, not, you're not trying to fit it into a broadcast yeah. schedule, you yeah. can kind of um, expand or shrink to fit the yeah. So the idea only really lasts as long as it's, yeah. it has the potential to. Yeah. yeah. Some, which is, can be a real pain in the arse, actually, weirdly, when writing them. Because one thing I used to do, when, they were, when I was writing episodes that were going out on commercial television, I would, use the, I would write in the ad breaks. Not, I wouldn't describe the adverts, that would be insane. <laughs> but I would write in, like, end of Who part this one. man enters? <laughs> because it was a, it's a good, useful waypoint, just the psychological, all I have to do is get up to the next... If I can make it to the next ad break, then I could go to bed. Yeah. Um, so yes, I just dramatically. Sort of yeah. Use those as markers as to how far through I was. Yes, I hadn't thought about that, of course, yeah. So, whereas with Netflix, you just... You have to have an internal pacing system mm. that isn't predicated on here's where the adverts go. Yeah. Well, I start this this season coming up. I started. Get, I I got a little stricter with myself about right. I'm going to pack these ones into this amount of time mm. because you do you can because again when you're when you're cutting something for commercial television, there's often a point where it's like you know it's 48 minutes long and you've got to get it down to 43 minutes and and you know, everyone's in the edit suite going well we can't this is terrible this is like mutilating a baby we can't possibly it's a perfect we can and, and it's always better basically once you once you have yeah. done it it's, it's mm. almost always better so um been a bit probably a little more i've been a bit a little more mindful of, about that probably at the scripting stage yeah and we were also talking beforehand as well that the netflix the they don't reveal viewing figures. So mm -hmm. the other great thing, perhaps, about being freed from, from you know, the, the, the commercial channel is that, is that you can uh, just do what you want to do without the fear of being cut down, scythed down, because, you know, the requisite number of people aren't tuning in. Now, that is amazing. That is brilliant as well. That is, it is great to not have to worry about numbers or not have to worry that oh there was a snooker match on the other side and uh, so no one bothered <laughs> no one yeah. bothered tuning in yeah. or you know um or something that you you're it's, not you're not going to fall victim to an, an anomaly of scheduling you're just going to yeah. fail on your own terms no. yeah basically it's, so but it's perfect for an anthology show where you don't have any cliff, cliffhangers you yes. don't have that impulse to come back next episode for character or story point of view mm -hmm. so um you know you it's i think black mirror is more of sort of word of mouth show because as charlie was saying it's very hard to market when you're trying to keep everything back so you want so people find it eventually over time and so you know netflix is is the home of that so, maybe yeah. nobody's seen it <laughs> yes no one has seen it that would be but yeah. but it's li you know it's liberating for netflix because they in that sense they have to they have to make high quality shows to get people to, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. to, to yeah. pay for Netflix. And so it's much more about reputation of their shows than it is about the volume of people watching. Well, it's also, I suppose I hadn't really thought about this, but it's also, it's odd in that, like, like because you, you can watch, people often say, What's the, what order should I watch the episodes in? And there is no correct right. order in a way. Um, I mean, that's a whole debate is what order we end up like sequencing them. Yeah, it's a bit yeah. like sequencing an album or something like that. There is, you can just watch one. If there's only one, if you look through the episode titles, only one appeals to you, you can. And which is a benefit in this day and age when there's so many amazing TV series. It's yeah. frankly disgusting. <laughs> you know, it's like, so there's lo I've got, I'm walking around with a constant sense of guilt at the moment because I haven't seen The Handmaid's Tale. Oh. You, know, um, you know, there's things I've got to catch up on. I'm still, I, I just only saw Line of Duty last fucking week um <laughs> you know so there's uh there's so in a way we're a short commitment for a, a, a viewer as well so i suppose yeah you know uh which is refreshing yeah in, in a five you, season commitment and you couldn't do that week to week when you you know with a traditional broadcast platform <laughs> How, how much as well? I think we're, we're almost out of time, so I'll make this a, a final question. But now there's no 
sort of geographical blocker. Now, now you're with Netflix and, and your stories can be seen across the world. Does that shape the material as well, the idea that you are playing to a global audience? You, you, you start off, the, the first Black Mirror was such a quintessentially British story. I thought so, yeah. You know, yeah. it really, really was. It's like, oh yeah. God, for Queen and Country, I am going to have to <laughs> fuck this pig. And, you know, if, it was <laughs> Donald, if it was Donald Trump, he'd be going, I'm going to make this pig come. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, there's a sequel idea. What? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Make pig come great again. <laughs> um, but is there that uh, that trajectory that you start with this this incredibly British tale of pig fuckery, and then you move now towards store not not only locations but also stories that have to be globally ac accessible. Yeah, yes, but if you st I mean, yes, you can't think like that, though, can you? you because if you sort of, I'm making this for the, yes. you're, you're only ever making it for, for the yourself. Chechnyan market. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is odd in that I think because our stories are quite universal, hopefully, and so like in terms of setting, a lot of them could be set. Shut up and dance, which mm. is the was very sort of British setting. Originally, we conceived that as being set again in America, yeah. and then we just changed our minds and we thought it was as it became more and more. Um, honed down and we wanted to make it sort of grittier and grimier and nastier. Mm. It's like mm -hmm. Hounslow seemed to be the place to go. Um, I'm sure Hounslow's lovely. Which there are, a lot of Hounslow is lovely. Um, so, so you can sort of, you, we, we don't try to think about it too much, but you are, I mean, you're mindful. Obviously, just yeah. on a practical sense, we have, to, we have to submit everything a bit, we have to get to the finish line a bit early for it to be translated into every language on Earth, yes, basically. So there's mm. that sort of thing, and mm. you have to be mindful of the number of ma yeah. amount of text no, you can see on the screen. Yeah, I think it's um, it's, it's been more liberating, mm. I would say. So mm. something like Nosedive, which was the Bryce Dallas Howard of the satire about you know about social anxiety and reputation. Um, we, you know, that could have been set in the UK, but it just felt if you were creating the aspirational world, you would, it would be California. It yeah. would be mm -hmm. glorious sunshine and everyone's You want that and brightness, happy. you know. Yeah, yeah, and that artificial mm. palette. So, so you just, you're allowed to do that much more readily, I think, if it's an international mm. Yes, well, Crocodile, platform. which is one of the episodes coming up, we shot in Iceland, but we yeah. don't sort of say it's Iceland. It's just, it's a, it's, it gives you a slight, it unmoors you from, yeah. we never say what time period our episodes are set in most of the time. Mm. Um, yeah. I just realised what Donald Trump would actually do oh, no. if he was fucking a pig. Okay. He'd, go, he'd go, I am not fucking this pig. Yeah. Fake news. <laughs> um, this is not happening. Um, Hillary's emails. Hillary's emails. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that seems the perfect way to end the session. <laughs> On that bombshell, ladies and gentlemen, please. Thank you. Charlie. Oh, no.